I welcome you to this uh, seminar today on uh, gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometer GCMS. Today, what I am going to talk about the basics of mass spectrometry, building blocks of quadrupole GCMS, and what is the electron ionization, or you might have heard about electron impact ionization, what is qualitative analysis, and what is quantitative analysis. And as I have told on Monday, MS works on an ionization technique. It's a destructive technique. Your compound is ionized and no absorption or emission in the electromagnetic radiation. So we call it mass spectrometry and not mass spectroscopy. So if you want to make a very good impression to people, then you can always use mass spectrometry. But if you say mass spectroscopy, people will follow, but then that may not be the correct nomenclature. Yesterday we talked about it. Then, you know, you have a mobile face, which is a gas. Then you have a column oven and the column oven, the important three Parts are the injector and the column and the detector. And the column being the heart of the instrument because that is where the separation takes place. And from the detector, it goes to a signal. You get the GC chromatogram. We also talked about the sensitivity of the detectors. Dr. Datta said, what are the different types of detectors? And on this scale, what you have to see is that the concentrations that we can deal with and you can go from milligrams up to femtograms. That's a big dynamic range. Okay. And also I have said what is PPB and what is PPM. So people sometimes will use PPM. Sometimes they will use in nanogram, picogram, microgram, etc. Okay. So this you can see one PPM is one nanogram per microliter. So these are the type of concentrations you should worry about. And the detectors we talked about TCD, which is nearly a universal detector. Then we said FID detector. FID is used for compounds which can be really burnt. Okay, that's gas free flammable. Otherwise, you cannot use FID. Then ECD is a selective detector, electron capture detector. It is used where you have halogenated compounds or even nitro compounds. Wherever there is an electronegative group present in the compound, you can use ECD. NPD is used for NPD, you can use for nitrogen, phosphorus. So you can use nitrogen which comes to picogram levels of sensitivity. For phosphorus, you can go to femtogram levels of sensitivity. FPD is specifically, you will be used for sulfur, especially sulfur is very important in the petroleum industry. A lot of the cost of the crude, right from the cost of the crude, that depends upon the amount of sulfur present and also final product, how much sulfur is present. So FPD is very much used in a petroleum industry. Now mass spectrometer is definitely a universal detector and that sensitivity can to femtogram levels and even below that, atogram levels. Now, there are mass spectrometers which are extremely sensitive. And you can do it in two modes. One is the scan mode and one is the SIM mode. Uh, I will explain both what is a scan mode as well as SIM mode as we go through. So this is just an initial introduction to you that a mass spectrometer can be used in two modes. One is a scan mode where we will scan a mass range. Let's say we will scan from 50 AMU to 500 AMU or 30 AMU to 350 or 375 or whatever you have, that is called the mass range that you will be scanning. And SIM stands for Selected Ion Monitoring, and I'll be talking about that also and where will you use this. And generally, the scan mode, you want to get a full spectrum, you will be using that in the qualitative analysis, and then you will be using this in quantitative analysis. What is qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis? I will talk to you a very interesting definition is here uh, as I move through it maybe in the next slide. So here is what we have been talking about yesterday in the GC and this I showed the same spectrum, same chromatogram I showed on the first day also, but it did not have all these things in the first days. It showed only two peaks. So I have modified that first day stock, first day slide into this way that in the GC when you do, you get the retention time and then it gets first compound gets separated and then this is called the retention time and it also depends upon how much compound concentration is there so you get a peak under that and peak under this area under the peak gives you what is the amount of type of concentration that you may have of the sample and then this is another one that you have the second compound coming out and this peak is due to if you are using an fid due to flame ionization detector these are the ions collected now, if you replace the FID with a mass spectrometer, then all these are containing but ions. All at every point, you have the ions of the molecule. Here, if you come, 
you have got whatever molecule that you are using here, you get the ions of the molecule, and these ions are taken, and you get a mass spectrum. Similarly here. So the advantage here between an FID and a mass spectrometer is, which Dr. Dattar said yesterday, for structural elucidation, you must go for a mass spectrometer detector. It is an expensive detector compared to a normal detector, but in FID, you have only a two-dimensional information. One is the time, and of course, the concentration, and then another one is the detector signal. So you will have the abundance or the absorbance, uh, not absorbance, you will have the, the abundance here of the compound, and here you will have time, which is the retention time, and underneath this, you can calculate what's the volume. So you can say a GC is good. If you have got a standard substance, so imagine if this is benzene and this is toluene. If you have to do that in GC, you will inject a benzene standard substance here, and then you will know it is a retention time here, and a toluene, retention time here of toluene. Then you inject your mixture, and when it gets separated here, you can say this is benzene and this is toluene. You will be able to get only retention time, and then the detector the signal to show you what is the concentration of your compound. So that is very good for you. So that, that is, uh, GC is good for that. But imagine if you have to get the structure of the molecule, you want to get the mass spectrum. So in a GCMS, you get a third dimension, which is the mass spectrum of your molecule. And when you get a mass spectrum of the molecule like this, of the compound A, then you can say it is straight away benzene because very, very, very hardly any other compound has got a mass spectrum like this with a molecular weight showing here 78 and so also toluene. And even if there is an aliphatic compound which has got 78 and 92, you will find that they give a lot of fragmentation and then your molecular ion may not be very strong. But in the aromatic compounds, you get that the molecular ion here is very, very strong. Unless they are substituted by many long chain compounds. So the mass molecular ion gives you a very good idea like what is the, what is the molecule. So if you give me a mixture of benzene and toluene, and if I'm trying to do by GC and FID, I may not be 100% sure to tell you whether it is benzene or whether it is toluene, even if I have got a standard substance. I can still ask you a question, how are you sure it is benzene and toluene? But here when you get a mass spectrum, the mass spectrum is like a fingerprint of, the, of, your, of that compound. So when you look at the mass spectrum, you can straight away say that, oh, this is the mass spectrum of benzene, this is the mass spectrum of uh, toluene. So that is what we call as an unambiguous confirmation. Unambiguous means with a certainty what is your compound that you are check, what you are analyzing. So that is the advantage of a mass spectrometer. Now, this axis, we talked about it yesterday, before, day before and all that. Now, if you are going to put a graph of the non-polar compounds to polar, that is low polarity compounds, mid-polar and very polar compounds. Now the very polar compounds are hydroxylated compounds, then the carboxylic acids, etc. they are high polar, and when there is non -fun no functional groups there, then you will say they are non-polar. For example, benzene. But if you take phenol, that will become a polar compound. And then from low molecular weight to high molecular weight. So if you plot the complete molecular space, all the compounds, organic compounds present in this world, then you get out there a huge spectrum, huge, uh, you know, graph. And the huge graph you will find, it is here, the low molecular and low molar compo non-polar compounds, which form a small percentage. Though it is a small percentage, that is hundreds of thousands of compounds. And they are amenable to GC, they are amenable to GCMS. And remember one more thing, you can do that GC and GCMS only to low molecular weight compounds, they are volatile and they don't decompose in heat. If you have got a thermally labile compound, then you will not do a GC or GCMS. Okay, and if some of the compounds have a hydroxylated compounds, hydroxyl group, you can make a derivative of it, an acetyl derivative, and you can make it volatile and you can use a GCMS. So in your lab, you have got only GCMS, Try to derivatize your polar compound and you see whether you can do by GCMS. Okay, and uh, so that is very uh, interesting that some of the polar compounds you can do by GCMS. And uh, one is acid, and if it is an acid, you can have a methyl ester. So you will do an esterification and you will do a methyl ester, and methyl ester also you can do the GCMS. Now, here you have mid polar 
and high polar compounds, which are many of them are non-volatile, and some of them are thermally not stable. So all these type of compounds, thermally stable, no problem. Even the compounds which are not thermally stable, you have to use them on another method, and that is where the HPLC becomes very useful. So all this area you will be using HPLC and LCMS. And what you see here, APPI, electrospray, APC, etc. This is taken from a mass spectrometry slide. So this is GCMS and this is LCMS. So this area will be I'll be concentrating to you on Friday. So let me keep it in pending. So today I will concentrate on GCMS, the volatile samples where you want to get your structure of your molecule and do a determination. What is mass spectrometry? This is very important slide to you. Very important to you. What is qualitative analysis and what is quantitative analysis? So when you are analyzing a unknown substance and you want to find out the structural characterization, the structure of the compound, that is called qualitative analysis. So once you know what is the qualitative analysis, suppose you have a mixture of two or three compounds and you identify your two or three compounds in the mixture, then the next step is that how much is the A present, how much is the B present, how much is the C present? And that becomes a quantitative analysis. So one is a qualitative analysis, another is a quantitative analysis. And one more tip I need to give you that never ever start doing a quantitative analysis of an unknown substance. So if I give you an unknown compound mixture of A, B and C, do not tell anybody I am trying to do the quantitation of A, B and C. I want to find out what are these. And that is not a good thing to start with as far as mass spectrometry is concerned. Maybe other physical separations you can do that, but in the mass spectrometer you will not do this. But always so important is that identify your compound first and then you get into the quantitation. Application in areas, very many areas which I discussed on the very first day that you can where you have to use the chromatography and the spectroscopy. These are many areas of applications. So I am not going to repeat this because this was already done on Monday. And if I get into this, we will not have time to cover the GCMS. Very important, acetyl salicylic acid. OK, here's the structure. This is salicylic acid. When you do acetylation, you get acetyl salicylic acid. OH is here. You are doing acetylation. So that is aspirin, the headache tablet. And if you see this, very interesting, 180 is the molecular weight of the compound. And remember here, you are not able to see the very good, the molecular ion, you are not able to see very high. The idea of doing a mass spectrum is you want to know what is the molecular weight. There are ways of finding out the molecular weight of the compound where you do not get the molecular ion. That area, which is called chemical ionization, which is a very small number of compounds, 5% or less than 5%. I will not be talking about that today, but that will be a separate talk. What is chemical ionization? At least I need 15 to 20 minutes to talk about it. But these are called fragment ions. So once you get in the mass spectrometer, this 180, the molecular ion fragments that really fragments into different ions, 138, 120, 92, 43, etc. And a mass spectrum containing all these ions are called, is called the mass spectrum of the molecule. This is like a fingerprint, like a fingerprint. Everybody has got their own fingerprint like that. Every compound has got its own fingerprint. So when you take aspirin, whether you take the mass spectrum, whether in Kashmir or Kanyakumari or Middle East or Far East or America, or New Zealand or anywhere, you will find the mass spectrometer of the salicylic acid remains the same, provided the conditions that you maintain the same or the mass spectrometer. Under the same conditions, which I will tell you later, which is the standard that we use, standard condition that we use in a mass spectrometer. And if you use that, the, acid, uh, the aspirin will ionize in the same way in any part of the world. And that is the beauty about mass spectrum. So you can identify the compound anywhere in the world, depending upon the mass spectrum. So this is what I said. It is basically that how you really plot the master charge ratio across one uh, X field, uh, the X axis, and on the Y field, the intensity. Now comes the ionization. As I told you, it is a destructive technique. The compounds undergo destruction in an ion source. So this is happening in an ion source. I will show you an ion source picture of the ion source later. But here what happens is take a molecule of acetone, CH3COCH3, the molecular weight is 58. So when you impinge electrons at a, a certain voltage, like a 70 electron volt, then what happens is 
you here for example in this molecule there you have got two lone pair of electrons on the oxygen one of the electrons get knocked off and when you get it again that gets knocked off then you will find that it will form a ion radical that a positive ion radical and this is m plus and you will find a dot and then molecular ion is formed and the molecular ion because it gets a lot of kinetic energy because of the electron coming and bombarding that what happens is it fragments into smaller fragments it goes into smaller fragments so that is what is happening here into a fragment such as 27 57 m minus 1 29 43 etc so that is what is shown here a molecule m goes to m plus and m plus goes to fragmentation so this is a neutral molecule neutral molecule undergoes one ionization this is m over z that is only one electron that is knocked off so it puts one charge so that becomes a positively charged ion on 58 and that undergoes fragmentation to give you these ions so this is the fundamental principle of mass spectrometry it's a destructive technique you are actually hitting the molecule with an electron and then you get your molecular ion and then molecular ion subsequently uh, goes and gives you the other ions and you plot them into this so on the x axis you have got the ions in an increasing order this is the molecular ion and the smaller when you study a mass spectrometer please start from here go from right to left don't read the mass spectrometer from here because very insignificant uh, ions will be coming over here at the lower in fact here we have scanned below 15 sometimes you can go down to up to 10 or even below mass spectrometer allow that but when i take mass spectrum usually i go from 20 or beyond or 25 and beyond i don't want the smaller ones but here it is important because you are able to do ch3 plus so if you know your molecule you can even decide what is the mass range that you want to follow so here is the molecular ion and here is the 43 which is the base peak which is due to ch3 co plus and this ch3 plus and c2h3 so all this put together in this way that this is a 100% this is called the base peak and these are relative intensity and when you do acetone under 70 electron volt anywhere in the world and when you put the spectrum 43 will be the base peak 58 will be here 15 and in this ratio so the percentage of this will be for example you can say this is around 25% of the base peak this is about 40% of the base peak so i can even give you that this one of the peaks base peak is 43 and i can give you 58 there is an ion at 58 which is 30% there is an ion at 15 which is 40% there is an ion at 27 which is 10% and with that you will be able to draw the mass spectrum of this compound so when you are having in a college when they give you these are the percentage of the ions you should be able to plot your mass spectrum that is the beauty of expressing this in terms of percentages among okay, this is the relative intensity the, the base peak is considered as 100% these are the relative intensities so it is not an absolute intensity so this is called relative intensity the tallest peak is considered to be the base peak which is 100% i hope it is clear to you this is a little complicated spectrum and this is cocaine but i will be using cocaine as an example in many of my presentations later because this is very typical ions 303 first of all let me tell you such a unique molecule there are not many in this world to give you 303 182 and 82 so even in the sleep when you show it to people with mass spectrometry knowledge that i am getting a mass spectrum of 303 182 and 82 just three ions you tell them and they will tell you oh it is cocaine no no difficulty at all in identifying cocaine because there is i don't think there is any other compound in this world which gives you a pattern of the ionization like this 82 being base peak 182 and 303 so 303 is the molecular ion something very specific about 303 first of all it is an odd mass number and there is something called odd mass i would suggest that there is a nitrogen in present in the molecule so when you have one nitrogen present in your organic molecule generally it gives you an odd mass number molecular ion if you have got two nitrogens interestingly it will give you an even number when you have three nitrogens it will give you an odd number when you have four nitrogens it will give you an even number so please listen to me carefully do not understand it partially because that can be very problematic so please check uh, be very careful about it so when you take 272 here for example then it is a 43 loss it is o ch3 this loss is going there and you get to 72 and when you are going away from here for example 
when you cleavage here, then you can get about 182 ion. The remaining part will come in there. And the 82 is due to the cleavage here. So the N, the N along with the other things, that will be the 82. So this is the fragmentation study. And here you can say 82 is the base peak and 303 is the molecular ion. And previously, in the previous terminology, we used to call it parent ion and daughter ion. So we have, we are not doing that now. It is called a molecular ion and fragment ions. So a presentation of the molecular ion and its fragment ions is called the mass spectrum of cocaine. So this represents the mass spectrum of cocaine. And once you get it, when you do it at 70 electron volt, that is the energy of the electron which is impinging on this compound. Anywhere in the world, you will see that you will get the same mass spectrum. And cocaine is a very important compound, as I told you, because that is causing a lot of chaos in this world. So we need to really stop smuggling of it. And though I will be telling in a few examples, even when I come to quantitation, Sindhiti has got three important ions. I will refer to 303, 182 and 82 in my future presentations. So please remember this 303, 182 and 82. 82 is the base peak. 182 is here another very intense peak and 303 molecular ion has a reasonable intensity. When you take a dodecane, for example, an aliphatic chain group, long chain compound. Unfortunately, the long chain compounds, you will see the molecular ion is not very stable. It undergoes very severe fragmentation. And it will give you a pattern as if you have a loss of 14. It is not CH2, CH2 loss. It is cleaving some other places, but it gives you an impression as if you are losing 14. 85 minus 14, 71, 71 minus 14, etc., etc. But it is not a CH2 loss. There is no CH2 loss in mass spectrometry. Okay. So here again, this is the base peak and this is the molecular ion. And if you want to get the molecular ion of it, you will do chemical ionization, which I am probably I will touch upon it when I am doing LCMS, just to give an analogy between chemical ionization in GCMS and the electrospray ionization. These are some of the Commercially available mass spectrometers. This is I am not covering all the mass spectrometers available. There are many out there, I think, in different type of analyzers. And these are the four quadruple type of mass spectrometers that I have shown here in the alphabetical order. Their names: Agenon GCMS with an auto sampler. And this is the mass spectrometer. You can see GC is pretty big here. And uh, here, if you see, I think no, see the GC, and this is the mass spectrometer. I'm sorry about it because it is slightly bigger. It used to be even smaller than at one time. And this is the Perkinomer GCMS, and you can see this is the mass spectrometer region, and this is the GC area, and this is Shimotsu GC, and with the uh, with the uh, you know reader here, and here you can see the mass spectrometer is here from here to here. Again, GC is bigger, and here is the thermo instrument, and this is the GC with an auto sampler, and this is the mass spectrometer side. So mass spectrometer you can say is a closed box. It's a black box where it is coming under what is why it is a black box. I will tell you later because you don't want to open the mass spectrometer as much as you open the GC. GC you have to open because you have to open the door, you have to change the column, you have to put the injector, you have to do so many things, but a mass spectrometer you will rarely open unless you have to clean it up. So when you go to GCMS, these are the building blocks of a mass GCMS. This is a sample inlet which is the GC here, gas chromatograph. Now, when you have to have different sample introductions, if you are working with the volatile organics in water, then you will use a Persian trap and that you will fix onto a GC. If you are using a headspace, which I explained yesterday and day before also, then the headspace will be attached to a GC. Then from the G, the, the, from the, head, the headspace analyzer, you will go into the GC from GC to mass spectrometer. And when you have a thermal disorder, for example, volatile organics in air, then you will use a thermal disorder. And you will use a pyrolyzer, GC with a pyrolyzer, if you are working with the polymers and you have to break down the polymers to monomers. And if you don't want to use the GC at all, then there is something called direct insertion probe. And that is really like, a, like an iron rod at the tip of it that you put a little bit of sample and insert into the mass spectrometer so you can bypass the GC. But many people don't use it nowadays because you use either GCMS or LCMS. But when the mass spectrometer started, I don't know how many spectra that we had to do using the direct insertion sample probe. That is called direct insertion probe, DIP. So here now with the capillary GC that it becomes very easy and capillary column 
directly goes into the mass spectrometer into the ion source using a capillary GCMS interface. Now the GCMS interface is nothing but a vacuum lock. Why do you need a vacuum lock? Because here you see, because you see that the GC here is a working at the atmospheric pressure. And from the atmospheric pressure, this has to go to the ion source, which is maintained at a high vacuum. So when you have from atmospheric pressure, if you have to go into the high vacuum, you have to have an interlock, vacuum interlock, and that is the GCMS interface, which makes sure that you know the atmospheric air does not go into the ion source. Why do you need an ion uh, high vacuum system? I will explain to you as we move forward. And this shows the most important parts of a mass spectrometer is GCMS. You must remember this. You know, if you are interested in mass spectrometry, and I know you are interested, that's why you are attending this. You need to have the four blocks are very important. One is the ion source, then the analyzer, then the detector. And then these are maintained under high vacuum. So the sample gets ionized here in the ion source. It is sent into an analyzer where they separate the, the, the masses according to their masses, with the, you know, whether it is a high mass or low mass, and it goes to the detector. Detector sees the ions as it is coming from the out of the analyzer. And it goes to the data system and printer, and you get the mass spectrum here. So that is in simple. And these three are maintained at a high vacuum system. So high vacuum is very, very important. And the ion source analyzer and gene detector. So if anyone asks you what are the important components of a GCMS, then you must tell GC is very important because that is a sample inlet system. And then you have an ion source where the sample gets ionized. And then you have an analyze, analyzer where you are ionized. The ions get separated according to the mass to charge ratio. And then it goes to the detector. Detector sees the ion and then that plots against this and to give the mass spectrum. And it is maintained under a high vacuum. Once you say these block diagrams, then you have clearly understood what is the GCMS. And I will explain to you each and every component of this now with the remaining time. And I think there will be enough time to explain to you. Even I go for five minutes or 10 minutes more, I'll make sure I give you the complete seminar. Now, having said this, this is an explorer diagram, as you can see. So from the GC in the capillary interface, it comes to an ion source. This is the ion source. So what happens in the ion source? Ion source ion formation takes place here. And then you have the quadrupole analyzer. And in the quadrupole analyzer, you have the ion separation. And then you have the detector. You have the detector where the ions get detected. So the three components most important are the ion source, quadrupole analyzer, and the detector. Quadrupole analyzer because we are using quadrupole analyzer in today's mass spectrometer. If you are using a time of flight TOF, you will say I am using a TOF mass spectrometer. If you are using a triple quadrupole, you will say I am using a triple quadrupole. If you are using a double magnetic sector, you will say I am using a magnetic sector instrument. If you are using an orbit trap, you will say I'm using an orbit trap mass spectrometer. And here, so the three stages, ion formation, ion separation, ion detection. And they are maintained at a high vacuum. So it takes you, the rough pump takes you from the atmospheric pressure to about 10 raised to minus 2 tor, and then the high vacuum pump takes you to 10 raised to minus 5 to 10 raised to 6 tor. How do we achieve this vacuum? OK, I will come back to that later, but let me first cover the ion source. So ion source is nothing but there is a rhenium filament here. And the rhenium filament, we pass a current. When you pass the current, then the electrons come out. And the electrons travel in this like a helical pathway. And when it goes in the ion source, he introduces the molecule from here, which are represented by the neutral molecule M. They are the neutral molecules, as you know. And then when the electrons go and impinge on them, you will find that some of the molecules are getting converted to M plus. They get they form the molecular ion. Then the magnet, don't worry, that is just to collimate the electron beam. So don't worry if you see something in the picture, don't worry. The most important things I am already covering. And here I am taking you back to this here. This is also a cross section of the ion source. Now here the molecules are coming. This is the filament. Electrons are coming. And these electrons are, you know, coming and impinging on your neutral molecule and the neutral molecule M plus is formed and the, and some of the compounds, some of the molecules are not ionized and the carrier gas, whether you have you are using helium and the unionized molecules of your eluent, they are pumped down by the pumping system and then the molecular ion here 
fragments into F1, F2, F3, F4, etc. The fragment ions. And the F2 can also come from F1, F2 can also come from M. That is, as you understand more and more mass spectrometry, you will be able to understand how one fragment came from the another fragment or from the molecular ion itself. So many of the fragments can come from the molecular ion and some of the fragments can come from another fragment ion. So the combination of all the molecular ion and all the fragment ions put together and when you plot a graph, then you get your mass spectrum. So that is the beauty about it. So once again, the filament, the filament, rhenium filament, you just pass a current through the rhenium filament, then you get the electrons coming down like a helical fashion and your neutral molecule is there. Neutral molecule get ionized, one electron is knocked away from that and then it forms the M plus like I showed in acetone and the molecular ion has a lot of kinetic energy because electron comes and hits it and that kinetic energy is used in order to fragment the molecular ion to fragment ions. So that is in simple what is ionization. Now our job is how to move the ions that is formed in the ion source into the quadrupole analyzer. So this is just repeating the same. The fragmentation is just a pictorial representation. If you have got ABC, it can fragment in many way, A plus plus B dot. This doesn't reach the, the, whatever is a neutral fragment, it will not reach the detector. It will be killed. Right there it will be pumped down or it will go and hit somewhere and it will die. And this A plus B plus, you can have AB plus C dot, this is neutral. And you can have AB dot, this is neutral and C plus. Similarly, this way also that can have a simple rearrangement to A, B, C, you can have this way also. And you can have sometimes cyclization. ABC can undergo cyclization and they can form this and then AB, ACB and CAB also and it can undergo fragmentation. So many things are possible in mass spectrometer and generally you don't have to worry about it. These type of rearrangements are very rare. Straight away you get your molecular ion and you get fragment ion. So it is actually not bad. These are all if I have to talk about exceptions. So these are not the general rule. Generally, you have got very straightforward fragmentations and you will be able to get the molecular ion and the fragment ions. You will be able to get the structure as I showed you cocaine, as I showed you acetone, as I showed you aspirin, etc. They are the normal. So 90, more than 95% of the compound will undergo like that. A single, uh, you know, you will remove one electron, form the molecular ion, it will undergo fragmentation and it is easy for you to study your molecular, your mass spectrum. So not to worry about that. Don't, don't worry about the exceptions. Exceptions will, if you worry about it, that will discourage you. I'm not going to talk, there are two types of pumps. You can read about it later on. Diffusion pump to take from the atmospheric pressure to the high vacuum. This is an outdated, it used to be used in the old mass spectrometers. And even this is a marvel. This is one of the greatest creation, one of the nice creations of mankind, which is called turbo molecular pump, which rotates at a very high speed. 80,000 RPM, 100,000 RPM, etc. It's a marvel. It's almost like when you look at a jet engine, you can think about a thermomolecular pump. Again, I am not going to explain to you how it you know, uh, works. It is really sucking away the molecules from a centrifugal force. It's a very nice way that it is structured. Why do you need a high vacuum? This is more important, not the engineering part of it. But basically, you need to protect your filament from burning. Just like in an incandescent bulb, if there is some of the air or some of these gases present, it will burn your filament. And then changing a filament in mass spectrometer can be very tedious, time consuming and expensive. These filaments are expensive, so you have to, you have to preserve them. And pumps out the carrier gas and the anions molecules out of the system because you need to create a very, very, you don't want any ion molecule interaction. Anytime you have got an ion, and they are nearer to a neutral molecule, they try to go in ion molecule interaction, which is called self chemical ionization. Don't worry about it, but the ion molecule interaction is very common in organic chemistry. And then this is very important that the vacuum allows mean free path. Like if you have got a small tube through which it has to go, imagine if it is filled with the uh, gas molecules, then your ions which are formed will find it very difficult to go through. It is almost like you're going through a railway station and you have to climb a bridge. And the bridge has too many Z bridge, like for example, the other bridge. If you have to go through the other bridge, there are so many people, then you cannot get to the other end easily. And you are sometimes completely stopped and you will not be able to even reach the other end. And that you want to avoid. So you remove all the molecules 
and so that your ions that are formed will reach the detector. That is called the mean free path. And also that you don't want these unnecessary air molecules or the neutral molecules to reach at the detector and that will kill the detector. How the detector is kept, what is the science behind the detector? When I explain to you, you will understand how we have to protect the detector. We have to protect every part in a mass spectrometer. We have to protect the ion source, we have to protect the analyzer, we have to protect the detector. And that also I will explain to you. Very important, and this is the quadrupole uh, mass analyzer. And the quadrupole mass analyzer is almost like four rods. Four rods like this, and then there are alternating currents between the opposite poles into positive and negative charges. And then that, that one will create a magnetic field here. Now, this is where the ion beam comes from, the ion source, it goes through here and there is a magnetic field here. So depending upon the ions which are stabilized according to the magnetic field, we sweep a RF frequency. Don't worry too much about the theory of quadrupole because it is not easy and it is not very interesting to an organic chemist as of now. So when the ion beam comes here, understand this, that there is a magnetic field and the ions start resonating. So they will start resonating and they will get separated according to the mass to charge ratio. According to how you see it, the, the big ions will move first or last and the small ions will first go faster and the next ion, next ion. So they are swept depending upon how you sweep your magnetic your field, electrostatic field. Okay. So when you go the RF frequency, sorry, RF frequency. So this is where your ions get resonated and it reaches the detector. So this is the policeman where it separates your ions according to their mass to charge ratio. So that will separate. You go first, you go first. Just like in a classroom, the teacher will say, they will line up the students and they will say, you go first, you according to the height or weight or whatever. They will say, you go first, you go first, you go first. That way, they see there is a lot of discipline. And the, this quadrupole is nothing but a disciplinarian. It disciplines all the comp of the ions to go one by one and that reaches the detector. And that is the idea of the, the analyzer. So you have the ion source, and from the ion source, the ions going into the quadrupole analyzer, which is like a policeman. It will arrange all the ions according to the mass to charge ratio, and they will reach the detector. Next is the detector. So this is the quadrupole end, as you can see. So end of the detector, you will find the ions coming, and the ions coming and hitting here. This is called a high energy diode. Today, it is very standard for people to use a high energy dynode. This is a metal plate, a thick metal plate, which is maintained at minus 10, uh, plus minus 10 kV. So if you are working with the positive ions, you will keep a minus 10 kV and the positive ions will come and hit it hard. So when it comes and hit it hard, you will find the electrons coming out. The electrons will come out and this is a horn-like structure. And the horn-like structure, inside of the horn-like structure, you have beryllium oxide. So beryllium oxide is coated here and when the electrons come in, in fact, it is interesting. There's a lot of work that we have done to find out all this. Many people will not let you out, tell you the secret about what are the things they have coated. So it will take for you to read many things to understand how an electron multiplier is made. But I am giving to you a very important information to you so easily that you don't have to search anywhere. So this is coated with beryllium oxide. I don't know what are the other type of compounds available, maybe other compounds but a beryllium oxide is a very good agent. So the electron comes and strikes here. So one electron becomes two electron, two electrons become four electron, four becomes eight, 16, 32, 64, so on and so forth. And why you are doing is electron multiplier simply means you are multiplying the electron voltage so that you can get the milliampere measurement. What you are measuring in a mass spectrometer is actually what is the milliampere that is coming out. And there is a very nice English word for this, which is called cascading effect. When you are looking at a waterfall, you will be seeing the waterfall coming like this, like this, and you call it as a cascading effect. And here exactly this is called same cascading effect. So the electrons, the electrons come here, one electron becomes two, two, four, and that is called cascading. Finally, you measure the voltage. Now, how the voltages mean convert into mass spectrometer? Now, this is called continuous dynode electron multiplier. You can use a mass spectrometer in positive mode or negative mode. So if you are using negative mode, 
then you will be having again electrons coming out but the negative ions will be coming and electrons will be coming out basically it is the same thing but you can switch the voltage into positive or negative depending upon how you want to attract this okay so that is very interesting so this is a cross section to show you the ion source and there is a set of steel lenses here these are not optical lenses and they are completely uh, allowed to go through this the quadrupole analyzer and some which are disobedient ions they will, do not resonate with this and the magnetic field then they will be killed here they will go and hit the ion rods and they will die these are made of steel special steel ion rods this quadrupole and they will hit the ion rods they will die and the ions which are stabilized very well resonating ions they will go and the reach the detector and you will be able to see the mass spectrum so the detector is like an io the mass spectrometer it keeps sitting here looking for what are the ions coming out so you have a beautiful way ion source where you form the ions of your compound neutral compound and then once the ions are formed fragment ions and the molecular ions are passed through a quadrupole analyzer where they are separated according to mass to charge ratio and then it goes to the detector again you remember this separation is the separation of masses that is positive ions it is not a chromatography separation so don't think that when you put a mixture into a mass spectrometer you can separate it it will be very difficult so you will get a complete spectrum of mixtures and not of individual compound so make sure that you do a good gas chromatograph you have to operate the gas chromatograph in very good uh, conditions so you separate your compounds very well and then the mass spectrometer mass spectrometer has a high speed today so if you take even an essential oil which has got hundreds of components and in a capillary column you will see that the peaks are coming out very fast and the uh, mass spectrometer is also very fast the scanning of this is so fast that you will be able to see the mass spectrum for each and every compound so today there is no limitation today you have got the best available mass spectrometers from the manufacturers and you can do your uh, analysis of your mixtures very easily only thing you have to make sure that you use the right column right chromatography conditions and you separate your compo components of the mixture this is a very important compound this is where i call as a i told you that the from the electron multiplier it comes and falls and it knows which are the ions in order for it to know what ion is falling you need to really calibrate the mass spectrometer so that is called mass axis calibration so you will inject into the mass spectrometer before you start the experiment something called perfluorotributylamine now this is the structure of the molecule and this molecule has got okay base peak at 69 and a very strong peak at 219 and then it has got another at 502 so we will choose three, these three ions because we want to make sure the mass spectrometer is calibrated on the low low range and calibrated on the mid range and it is calibrated on the high range so if you calibrate this area as three, three scales the low range mid range and high range you have absolutely no problem you can do the mass spectrum of any compound that you want so when you inject this and you tell the mass spectrometer this is 69 this is 219 this is 502 so you calibrate the mass spectrometer so next time when you are doing your compound and then it falls here two two numbers before this 502 it will immediately tell you your molecular ion is 500 or 496 or 414 or whatever and if it is coming here it will calibrate from here okay there is a peak here 222 and here 70 etc so that your mass mass axis calibration is taken care of by this compound and this has got a low vapor pressure very stable compound it is used by all manufacturers gcms manufacturers use the same compound and that is called perfluorotributylamine it is in a very small bottle will be staying and it is automatically injected into the mass spectrometer and that will do that and now the auto tune computer will do everything for you you have to just click auto tune a small amount of this goes into the mass spectrometer ion source and it does a complete calibration for you it arranges all the voltages and everything for you the mass spectrometer is ready for you to go many many years ago we had a big problem because we had to do the manual calibration we used to take long time just to calibrate this compound but today's instrument and also that we had to do this calibration every day because the mass axis was not very stable of the mass spectrometer today's mass spectrometers even if you did not do that one week or two weeks you have absolutely no problem once in a while you have to make sure you check 
and then if you have a report if you are doing a sample and you have to submit a report then definitely you need a, an auto calibration and it'll, along with your report you will attach that today when i was doing the mass spectrometer this was in very good condition so that becomes a proof that the mass spectrometer was in good condition before you carry out your experiment especially quantitation work signal to noise is very important what is signal to noise we talked about sensitivity now when sensitivity is very important because in the lowest the lowest level of concentrations if they are present in picogram levels or femtogram levels 10 to the minus 15 your mass spectrometer should be able to analyze it so one is that qualitative analysis is done in a full scan so if i have to do qualitative analysis let us say cocaine cocaine along with cocaine there are other substances i want to find out i want to identify whether cocaine is present then i will separate the compound i will do a scanning maybe i will start from 25 amu atomic mass unit a mass range from 25 to let's say 350 or 400 or 500 and as soon as a peak comes here many peaks will come a peak here if i am suspecting uh, cocaine look at all the peaks it will tell you oh here it is this is the cocaine i am seeing the cocaine spectrum so that way you can qualitatively understand what is the mass, what the mass spectrum shows you cocaine is present and then if you want to also tune your compound if you are to inject some standard compound that's a cholesterol and you want to just see how it or or uh, some benzene compound and you can do injection and you get a strong peak there and you find out what is the noise level here and how the peak is coming out and the peak divided by this average of the noise it is called the signal to noise ratio so you can say the sensitivity compound is very high 25 is to 1 if i am using such and such compound so you can do that if you want to use a hexachlorobenzene or if you want to use a cholesterol or whatever you tell when i am using such and such compound i am getting the signal to noise very good so you know when i inject that one microliter sample i see that the concentration in picograms it is giving me 25 is to 1 so that is called signal to noise now if i am doing if i have to go to lower levels of detection suppose my presence of cocaine in the mixture is very very low or in the sample is very low so what i do is that i know the ions of cocaine which is 303 182 and 82 so i tell the mass spectro instead of we scanning the entire range from 30 amu to 500 amu every ion that you are looking at i tell the detector don't strain yourself don't look at all the ions look at only these three ions so the quadrupole stations itself into three ions which is uh, which is 303 182 and 82 then the detector has only three easy job it keeps collecting the ions what is coming out and that will be very easy to get you more sensitivity so that is called scan and sim mode so in the sim mode i can get a sensitivity much much higher this is like somebody telling me telling you that so many people are going to come out you know of the theater and you count the number of people or count the number you count only the people who are 6 feet or 7 feet tall it is very easy for doing instead of counting all the people so you can say oh i found 10 people which are 10 6 feet tall very easy whereas if they say count everybody it becomes very difficult for you to do so that is what we do your sense your sensitivity is much higher if they specify as a 6 feet and above so your sensitivity is much higher mass spectrometer works in the same way so that is called full scan and selector and monitoring now when you are doing an identification qualitative analysis you will do it in the scan mode when you are doing a quantitation analysis you will do in the selector ion monitoring so how do i do a selector ion monitoring in quantitation so if you go if you have to quantitate cocaine for example what i will do is that i'll make standards of cocaine four or five levels of standard and then i will uh, i will tell the mass spectrometer say quantitate the ion 182 and you can look at 82 and 303 when you see an ion 182 with the two ions on the side and please quantitate that compound and that way you can use it for quantitation it will not be very clear to you but when you start using qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis what i say now will become very clear right now those who are using mass spectrometer it will be very easy for you but those who are not using the mass spectrometer you will come to know about it once you start using it once you go to a mass spectrometer and when you are in a lab ask them these questions what is full scan and what is selector ion monitoring they will be able to explain to you it will become very clear to you at that time 
And also when you are doing this scan mode for qualitative analysis, you want the full mass spectrum. So for example, when you have a compound mixture like this, and then you get one of the peaks here, which is 4.9, this, this will be the molecular rate of the, this can be the molecular, this may be the mass spectrum, and you can search that. And I think one of the compounds in this probably is cocaine. So you can see that you get the cocaine mass spectrum there at the top, I mean the sample spectrum, and then this is the library research. Then it will immediately tell you that the library will tell you the compound that you are working in is cocaine. You don't have to worry about it at all. Within five seconds or less than five seconds, the computer will tell you the compound that the peak that you are looking at is this. Now you can automate the complete peaks. All the known compounds, the computer will be able to tell you very easily. So if you have got 10 compounds or 15 compounds, environmental analysis or drug analysis or whatever you are using, then you can see in doping analysis that we will be talking about, you can do the uh, the peaks like what I showed you before and all the peaks can be automatically, automatically you can uh, do the mass spectrum each peak and then do a computer search and it will print out to you that compound peak one is so and so and so and the computer says this is such and such combo. You can completely automate the mass spectrometer, go for a cup of coffee or lunch and by the time you come back all the results will be done for you automatically. That is the type of automation today you can do. So this is the computer search. This is just to show you paracetamol and phenacetin, small molecules, and we can always interpret these various ions where it is breaking, etc. I am not into the interpretation of mass spectrometry today. That can be a separate session of, you know, once you understand the mass spectrometry, I think we can always go to the next level, which is interpretation of mass spectra. Spectrum is singular, spectra is plural. This is the quantitation. Again, as I said, make different levels and the mass spectrometer has a very wide dynamic range from a low concentration to a high concentration. So you can see the microgram per liter, you can make low concentration, high concentration, and you can inject whatever is your unknown concentration, and you can tell what is the concentration of your compound. So an excellent method for finding out your quantitation experiments. You can use it for environmental, for doping studies, for you know whatever you have, pharmaceutical chemistry, anywhere you want. Different different type of mass analyzers will tell what type of mass spectrometer you are using. Magnetic sector, quadrupole, triple stage quadrupole, ion trap, time of flying, orbit trap. Orbit trap is one mass spectrometer which was introduced a little more than 20 years ago. And if there is any invention that has happened in mass spectrometry in the recent years, in the few decades ago, it is only orbit trap mass spectrometer, which has also even led to a Nobel Prize. It's really amazing instrument. And we have several of that in India right now. Very, very expensive. We are talking about a few hundred thousand dollars, but it will work for small molecules, LCMS mode, for small mole organic molecules, for really protein molecules, peptide molecules, etc. If you have this, then you can do almost anything that you want to do in mass spectrometry today. So with that, I want to end here. Once again, I want to tell you, impress upon you, that GCMS is not a very difficult technique. It is used for the compounds which are volatile and thermally stable, whatever you can do in GC, you can do in GCMS. Mass spectrometer is an expensive detector. It is nearly a universal detector. If you can ionize your compound, you can do a mass spectrum. So if it is if it is stable in the ion source, you can impinge with that with the electrons. Then the electrons really uh, give you a molecular ion. Molecular ion undergoes fragmentations. Then the, all the molecular ion along with the fragment ions are pushed into the quadrupole analyzer. The quadrupole analyzer, they are separated according to their masses. And then these masses are coming out and there is an electron multiplier detector. The detector sees the ions and it plots it against mass range and intensity. The intensity will tell you how much of it is present, the ions, and that the combined peaks, molecular ion and all the fragment ions together, you get the mass spectrum. So in the mass spectrum, the most intense peak is called the base peak, and the other combo, other peaks are relative uh, intensities. So 303 is much less, maybe around 10 to 15 percent compared to 82, and 182 maybe around 60 or 70 percent compared to 82. So when you put all of them together, then that becomes a mass spectrum. Mass spectrum you can do in qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis, and it is so sensitive that today that if somebody brings you a mixture and tells you that please find out, you tell me this is a mixture of 100 compounds and tell me whether cocaine is present in that. So all that you tell the mass spectrometer is that 
at uh, you know you say at such and such conditions inject a cocaine sample and you say it is coming out at 5.6 minutes and you inject the mixture and drill the mass spectrometer between 5 and 6 minutes look for a peak which contains 303 182 and 82 and if you get exactly at 5.6 a peak and it gives you the three ions then you can say 100% sure that the cocaine is present there and that is called the target compound analysis and you can say detection and then that way we say that you can find out a needle in a haystack that is the type of sensitivity we are talking about it and also in some countries as i told you on the first day that the the death is awarded to people who smuggle more than 15 grams of an active uh, substance such as cocaine so the life and death depends upon the quantitative analysis and mass spectrometer is the one which determines whether he gets death sentence or whether he becomes alive so for all these things i tell you that the mass spectrometer gcms is a extremely very powerful technique so those people who are using practicing gc i think you will find that you become much more powerful with the presence of a gcms and those who, those who can afford gcms go ahead and buy it and those who can really talk about lcms i will say the same if you can afford an lcms go and say, buy it provided you have such applications never spend money on something that you are not going to use that is not a wise investment please make sure how much you will be using what are the type of things that you want to do but, but today gcms is something that every student wants to have at the end of his laboratory because we want if he is doing a synthetic chemistry he wants to take the aliquots and go and see whether his compounds are formed or not so that is the type of power that the mass spectrometer has got so with that i would like to end my talk here and uh, i'll have to say bye bye to you